Great. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm going to finish this nice section on galaxy composition and metallicity by not talking about galaxy composition or metallicity. So it's going to be some of a little oddball out here, but um, I'm going to really talk about the cool gas around high Z galaxies. So I'm talking about like the molecular and atomic gas of, uh, of, these, of these higher Z galaxies. But before I start with that, I'll just do a little quick overview of how we observe these things at low redshift. So here's a nice picture of a stellar environment, a nice little galaxy right in the center. And if we look at this 21 centimeter emission, so that's one of the first the three main things that we can look at. We can see a couple of things that we can see right away. Two, two things here I want you to focus on. This one, it's very extended compared to the stellar um, emission that we see. And the second thing is this, this wonderful detail that we have for 21 centimeter. It really provides a nice way of studying gas in, in these kind of galaxies. Low redshift ones. Now if we go, another method is we can look at carbon monoxide. So carbon monoxide is, is unlike the H, uh, H1. It really traces like in like the, the densest uh, clumps right here. So it's isn't really the star formation. You know, a third method of looking at low redshift, at gas in, in low redshift, is so this is kind of a uh, is, is using fine structural lights like uh, nitrogen two, carbon two, oxygen one. There's a, there's a bunch of uh, lines. Is there an echo? I feel like there's an echo here. Anyway, so here's one example, it's the, the Herschel one. Uh, Herschel did a nice way, way of looking at some of, some of these galaxies, part of the Kingfish project. And there's all diff different kinds of these ionization structures, lines that they've done. And from that you can get like the density and uh, temperature of the gas by just looking at the ratio of these lines. But when we go to high redshift, some of these things we can't do. Actually, these bottom twos are just fine. You can actually do these bottom two at, at high redshift. But the top one is going to be somewhat more of a complicated thing. 21 centimeter really is limited low redshift. So here's kind of like a high redshift, high redshift example. This is redshift 0.24. It's not that high redshift. And that's kind of, it's kind of the max you can go to. This is kind of like the, the maximum amount. And after that, higher, if you go higher than this, it kind of it stops. There's just no way of going higher than this. So we can't really use 21 centimeter to probe atomic gas. So what do we do? Well, the answer right here is we move to absorption. We can look at for, for H1 gas in absorption. So there's some quasar spectra and there's some DLAs and lambda limb systems. Those are the ones I'm really focusing. They're really high column density systems. They're very advantageous to detect uh, absorption, uh, to detect the H1 gas. Why? There's, first of all, it's a nice way of probing like a nice range from the epoch of reionization all the way to the present. There's no limit and what we can't probe in that, in that range. The only thing that's limited is that you have to eventually go to space to observe this, but that's not a big deal. Um, we really, the other thing is that you really, it's kind of unbiased to the galaxy that's doing the absorbing. It really just happens, well, whatever gas is in front of the quasar, that's what you're gonna observe. It doesn't really depend on what, what, what galaxy really there is. Um, and the last thing is really, another nice this thing is that you really can get exquisite detailed resolution by just using a high resolution spectrograph. You can really get down to the nitty gritty of, these, of this gas. So these are really some good advantages. Those are some disadvantages. The first disadvantage is that you're probing a single sight line um, to any kind of galactic halo. There's no way of probing more than one. There's only a few examples where there's two quasars close enough or a lens quasar that you can actually probe uh, one galaxy halo. So you need to do some kind of statistical uh, description of this gas. You can't just look at a single galaxy and say, I'm just going to describe all this gas. So here's some two examples right here this, uh, of a statistical description. So all the gray points are just individual absorbers. And just by plotting them all in one kind of thing, you can see kind of overall trends. So here's an overall trend in metallicity. If you go to higher redshift, the metallicity of the H1 gas seems to be going down. Well, that's not a surprise, but it's good to see anyway. Another one is right here, another trend that's for redshift is that the amount of gas, is just the amount of gas uh, per volume seems to be going, uh, of neutral gas is increasing with redshift. Another disadvantage, kind of a main disadvantage is that it's very hard to find the, the galaxy associated with these absorbers. So here's the quasar in the, right in the center, and it's hard to see a galaxy that's, that's associated with that. You, it, this, this is a very deep image, and you can't even see it very hard. You need to do some kind of nifty trick, like PSS subtraction, and eventually you can see there's a kind of like a blob starts appearing, and you say, oh, that might be the galaxy associated. What you do is you line it up with, this, with a kind of spectrograph, and hopefully you get some, some kind of uh, emission signal from it, and then you can spectroscopically confirm it. 
But this is a, this one was in a, is a success example. That's why it's published. It's very there's for for one of these there's a bunch of them that were not detected, and there's it's been done. It's, they've been trying to do this for over 20 years, and there's maybe like a handful, maybe a couple of dozen detections all at low redshift, and that is a problem because it's very hard. Just ask any of of um, of any any of people working on simulations. What's the first thing they'll ask you? They ask, well, what type of galaxy is it around? We don't know that necessarily. We need to know first. We need to see the galaxy that's associated with it. And there's some kind of tr there's some kind of issue because when we look at simulations and see, okay, what causes absorption? It seems to be kind of a halo mass of 10 to the 10, 10 to 11. That seems to be kind of what we expect thing from from simulations. But when we look at like observe, observing, we might expect. So here's a gray band. It's actually from cross correlating the the absorbers with Lyman alpha forest. From that you can get a measure of the amount of the, the size of the mass of the halo responsible for it. It's kind of significantly larger. It's more like a few times 10 to 11. That's, that's kind of out here. That you don't, that's not the average that you would expect. So there's some kind of tension with observation in these simulations that simulations really kind of suggest smaller systems, whereas observations expect a little bit bigger systems. So we really want to kind of pinpoint it. We want to find an actual connection, we want to say, this is the galaxy, I want to measure the mass of that galaxy with that absorber, like a direct link. Like I said, optical, that's tough to do. So what's the answer? Well, just go away from optical. Let's try ALMA. So there's two programs that we tried not to do this with. So we tried one at low redshift, look for carbon monoxide, and another program we tried at redshift 4, to look for carbon plus, C+. Plus. Let's start with this low redshift carbon monoxide absorption. When we looked at these, we, did, we tried seven galaxies. What we found out is that we found five of these galaxies. Now, here's these emissions. But the first thing I want you to, just, to, to think about, here's four of these detections that you can see. So there's just flux and some kind of funky units uh, against some velocity. First thing you need to think about is, is that we detected five out of these galaxies. That is amazing because before, there was maybe a handful, and it took 20 years to get a handful. Now we did this, this, this was about four or five hours, the program, eh, seven hours with Alma. So we detected just five out of seven targets with just that few times, so a few amount of like, observing hours. So that's an impressive result just by the start of. Another thing that you can see is that the zero point right here in velocity is the velocity of is the, the, the redshift of the, absor of the absorber and it lines up very nicely. So you can, you can see that there's that there's a good chance that this a very good chance a very good, a large likelihood this is actually the galaxy responsible for the absor for the absorption. When we convert these fluxes into masses, we find some interesting some pr preliminary result. Notice that some of feels small five is kind of a tiny number. But well, we can see that their masses, their molecular masses, compared to some estimates of the stellar mass, now there's a, quite a big error in the x point right here. They're very kind of large, so interesting systems that they have kind of a lot of molecular gas in them. But the main thing, point here that you need to point out is again, we, this is an effective, effective way of detecting these, these galaxies. Now let's look at a little more in depth into one of these other systems. So this is the fifth detection. This is a significantly lower redshift. So because it's a lower redshift, we actually saw the optical. This is kind of a cheat, cheat one in the sense we knew that there was an optical galaxy right there that was responsible for it. So it was our test kind of case. And so this is a B-band image, the coloring. And the contours here are, is the CO emission. And you can see that the CO emission lines up perfectly with the stellar component. So we really are tracing that with CO, we really are tracing this galaxy perfectly. So when we look at their velocity, uh, profile. So you can look at the carbon uh, monoxide and you can look at the velocity range of it. You can, you can decompose this into some kind of, it looks like the, this is a typical profile of a disk structure, just like we see the stellar component. When we look at it right here, we can see its rotational velocity plotted as a function of distance from the center. And you can see it's a nice little flat component. When we look at that, compare now the absorber. So we're looking at the absorber right here. And the two components, that, that, that absorber has two components. The two components, 
One of them lines up perfectly with the disk, so that component of the absorber likely is probing the disk of this galaxy at a, at a significantly larger distance, like an impact parameter, about five. Yeah, it's, a little, it's about 8 kpc. But the other component, the more dominant component, is actually not probing that disk. It's actually probing the halo of the galaxy. So using kind of this combined thing, we can actually see where, this, where, the, where the gas is located. And the gas in this case is located all outside of the disk. Most of the gas is located outside of the disk at this, this, at this kind of distance. It's more in the, in the halo of these galaxies. Now, that's a low redshift. This is interesting. There's a lot more stuff here. I'm happy to talk more about this, but let's go to the high redshift stuff. But before I go there, let's do a quick, really quick review on C plus, 158 micron emission, because it's not a radio crowd here. So what is it? It's like the first, if you, if you have carbon plus, um, it's the first transition right here. So the, the ground state kind of splits up into two levels. And it's the first, so it's a, 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 a deaxation from that first level into the ground state. It's really the strongest near infrared line for most type of galaxies in the local, in our local neighborhood that we can collect. So it's it's very strong. Um, it's kind of difficult to say where it comes from because it can come both from molecular gas, atomic gas, and ionized gas. So it's really not a very it's a hard to make it as a diagnostic tool. But for the Milky Way, there's some nice, nice uh, work done, and it seems that most of this gas actually comes from uh, PDRs, uh, molecular gas, that's a CO dark, and cold H1 gas. That's kind of like the three main components. And this is only a small fraction comes from ionized gas. That's what these figures show. These are Milky Way sight lines. And it compares the CO line in blue with the red, which is C plus, and the black in is H1. And you can see that the red line, which is C plus, kind of lines up more with the CO, so with the PDRs, than with anything else. Now, when we go to high redshift, again, this is the amazing thing is that we again detected two out of the two, two galaxies. So we detected two galaxies, observed two galaxies, we detected both of them. Not only in 158 micron, but also in the dust continuum. So this is starlight being reprocessed uh, by the dust and then emitted at infrared wavelengths. So these are somewhat more complicated plots, but not too bad. The QSO is right here. Uh, in this case, let's, start with, let's look at this example. QSO right there, this is the galaxy in continuum emission, and this is the associated um, C plus line from that galaxy. So we've clearly detected, each outer sig signal right here is a three sigma detection. This is, uh, and then goes in, so these are clearly detected. There's no doubt that these are detected, and detected exactly the right redshift that we expected. So this really kind of highlights, again, the unique ability of using this line to detect these galaxies. No, this is not done with any optical. You can't do this. this is, it can be done, but not at these redshifts. Because these are, look at the redshifts here. It's 4.26 and 3.8. These are by far the largest, uh, highest redshift systems ever detected as, a, as having a, the host galaxy of these absorbers. Now, when we look at their relationships, so here's some two relationships. Uh, don't worry too much about it. This is a lumino uh, of what it really means. But the only thing I want you to show is C2 luminosity versus star formation rate. Uh, we get star formation rate from the dust continuum. These are quite significant star forming uh, kind of beasts. 110 solar masses and 20 solar masses per year. Um, and on this side, it's uh, far infrared luminosity versus the ratio of C2 over far infrared. What these things really should, what you should look at, black here, is some local, some high redshift galaxies. What I wanted to show with these plots is that these things kind of are normal galaxies. They kind of fall, fall exactly in that relationship. So we didn't find anything weird, which is good. We didn't want to find anything weird. We had no desire finding any weird things. We just wanted to find these things. So we found some nice, uh, sample, some nice galaxies that fit these relationships, uh, these expected relationships from luminosity-based samples. What we did find um, is we can use the, the we can use like a put like a virtual slit on the ALMA data and create a, like a, a it's called a PV diagram which right here is shown right here so that's distance along the the kind of <coughs> like virtual slit versus velocity and what this creates is this this nice little S pattern in both cases really indicates that these are disk galaxies um, these are little S shapes like that in a PV diagram really means that you're, you're looking at disk galaxies. Now, what 
that's that's good. We want to find the, we, from this galaxy we kind of get there, we can get calculate what their mass is, and their mass is about mm, uh, it's, uh, their mass is about uh, t 11, 10 to eleven solar masses. Uh, their halo their halo masses uh, are about ten to eleven. What is more interesting here is the very large impact parameter between the absorber and the galaxy. This is about 45 kiloparsecs at redshift 4.2. This is about 20 kiloparsecs at redshift 3.8. What does that mean? How can we explain gas? Like this is neutral gas. This is really dense neutral gas out there. How can we explain that kind of dense neutral gas that's that far away from these galaxies? Well, one way of thinking about this is they might be satellite galaxies. All right. The problem with that is that these are very high metal systems. Their kinematic structure doesn't really add up correctly. Um, and their redshift is exactly the right redshift of the gal host galaxies. And you'd expect maybe some velocity shift between the, 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 the satellite galaxies and the host galaxies. It's, it's, it's unlikely, therefore, that it's, it's, it's a satellite galaxy. I'm just going to cross that one up. Could it be outflows? Yes. There's a nice new paper here by the, from the fire example from uh, uh, Sasha Murta. And they, they show that at, even at large uh, distances, winds are very effective at getting their, 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 their mass, their, 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 their uh, metals out there in, the, in these distances. So it's possible there's outflows. The problem is it's to, make it, to make all this gas neutral. That's the trick. And that's, that makes outflow somewhat unlikely. Last kind of thing, could it be an extended ring? Like, I mean, it's, this is an, another nice example that Nir kind of showed in the first, uh, showed in the, in, in the first uh, day, is that when gas comes in, it kind of hits this outer layer right here. And this outer layer from this uh, simulation by Danovich shows that this actually could be DLA gas. Like it's dense enough to be DLA gas. And it's about a 30 kiloparsecs away from it. And the metallicity is about a tenth solar. So it could be an extended disk, that we're, that's what we're probing here. It's possible. With that, I'll leave it the summary with just a quick thing saying that um, Alma really provides an excellent way of finding these galaxies. So it's really the only way of finding host galaxies to absorbers. And really the, the future here is to increase our sample size. That's our goal for the next thing. And hope, thank God we got, we got the time for, for doing a couple of more of these uh, in, our, in the next cycle. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm really interested in the sample selection. So were these kind of, I mean, they were, they were DLAs or Lyman limit systems? These were, uh, so the, the high redshift ones were all DLAs, or so two DLAs. Okay. And the lower ones were some really strong um, Lyman limit system and okay. DLAs. And um, so, were they relatively cherry picked? Yes. Amongst the okay, they, they were because cherry picked. I was trying to understand because these these look like you know, ten to the twelve solar mass halos, or perhaps even a little bit bigger. I mean, they've yeah. got big gas reservoirs. They're forming stars actively. So we cherry picked them by metallicity. So we selected the highest metallicity systems at redshift four, oh, at redshift one, just so we can so kind of have proof of concept that this is going to work. And now we're just kind of like pushing it down. Trying to wear down all my tech to get them down to give us more time. Cool, thanks. Any other question? Yeah. So it's really exciting. Um, I guess in light of the previous question, is there anything that you can say uh, about the result that you highlighted? This really weird bias result from Boss cross correlation of the the forest with the DLAs. Can you say anything at this stage, or is it too early? I think it's too early. Um, ask me in a year. I'll be able to say more. Um, I think at least these two systems fit that in there perfectly. The ones that, that Wretched 4 ones fit perfectly that, that kind of. But exactly, they're high metallicity. So we could, that's not a, a general statement on the whole sample. So it's too early. I, I'm, I'm, I'm cautiously saying that it's possible that it's, it's, it's a correct statement, but what they're doing, that it might be right. Because these things are tough to look at, right? I mean, these are hard to look at in optical. Wouldn't that be like normal line of rate galaxies if the bias of the boss is trying to... Are they? I'm not so sure they are. Bias of 
Yeah, but I mean, why couldn't they be very dusty? Why would they be dusty? Why would they? <laughs> I don't know. That's, that's the whole point of doing this. No, you're absolutely right. And it, that's, I, I, I think you bring up a good point. And, and, and the answer is, that's why I said cautiously going there. But I'm not there yet. Okay, so let's thank the speaker and all the speakers of the morning session. <laughs> uh,